when my dad was in the hospital the first time and my mom and I were sitting there going, what are we going to do? Together, we both decided that the theme of this would be dignity and giving him as much dignity as we possibly could in a situation that can be messy. This is How to Care from Nurse Next Door. I'm Sarah Stockdale. My dad grew up in the interior of BC. He worked in the lumber industry. He was a business person, really active in the art world, and, you know, really liked by a lot of people we're finding out now. This is Julia Killey. We're hearing from her because in his final years, her dad received care from Nurse Next Door. And this is what Nurse Next Door is really about, the people receiving care. The caregivers, care designers, and even the office staff and franchise owners are all doing this for them. We've heard from those incredible staff in other episodes, and now it's time to talk to a client. So, in Julia's own words, we wanted her to tell her dad's story. Heads up, this episode does get a little heavy. He may have been a likable guy, but Julia's dad was not the easiest patient, and stories about someone's life ending can be hard to hear at the best of times. Julia's dad was living with brain damage, and that could make him erratic and difficult, on top of being a pretty stubborn guy to begin with. But the care staff were dedicated to making his final chapter as happy as possible. They cared for him, and they cared for Julia too. So let's begin with what led Julia to seek out Nurse Next Door in the first place, the moment her dad received his injury. He had a fall in the house, Luckily, we'd installed flood sensors, so when he fell, a washcloth dropped into the sink and started overflowing. So I got a phone call at 7.30 in the morning from the alarm company, and um, they were there with him. And so I raced over just to see him being put into an ambulance. From there, he was in the hospital weeks on end. They weren't really sure if he was going to make it or not because he had some major brain bleeding going on. And then, you know, he rallied and to everybody's total shock, came around and was ready to be discharged. And that's sort of where we got to nurse next door. Yeah, the washcloth in the sink, that's that's incredibly lucky. Holy cow. Yeah, yeah, someone was looking out for him that day. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so in that period of time when you was in the hospital, what was going through your mind? What were you trying to work out? What our life was going to look like moving forward. I mean, part of the time in there was just even trying to come to grips with the fact that he just may not survive this. And then on the other side was, well, where are we going to put him <laughs> after he gets out of the hospital? He was with it enough to say, I don't want to go into a home, but he had enough brain damage that he really couldn't just be left to do his own thing. So that's where we were sort of stuck and trying to find a solution. Oh, that's hard because it's, you know, he's going to need care, but he's already, you know, made his wishes very clear that it's only going to be a certain type. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he likes to drink and smoke and they won't let him do that (laughs) at a care home. Um, so we were really stuck. Plus, he was lucid enough that he could make all of his own decisions and stuff, but, you know, you never knew when his brain would turn off for a period of time. So, you know, then he couldn't be left alone in the house to drink and smoke because he could burn the house down. So we had to find a solution, and really, we weren't getting much from the hospital on what we were supposed to do. They are just like, he can go. (laughs) So so they didn't give you any support there, eh? Well, they're just like, what are we to do? For them, he goes in a home. That's all they can offer. And he was saying, hell no. So, you know, we were like, well, what on earth are we supposed to do? So we started looking on the internet and talking to friends and stuff that have had similar issues with their loved ones. And that's how we got to Nurse Next Door. What were your reasons for ending up choosing Nurse Next Door? We talked to them. We just really liked the way they sounded, what they could offer to us, how it could be a changing position. Because when he started, he was up and about and he'd go out for walks and things like that. But as he got sicker, it got to the point where, you know, he couldn't really stand anymore 
or his brain just sort of started to fade away more and more and he'd get ideas like that he left his rental car downtown that just weren't true. So having somebody that could move through all those different steps that his decay sort of took was really important because we didn't want to keep spending time going, well, now that he needs more care, we have to go find somebody else Mm. or things like that. And what did your dad think about that? At first, he was really resistant because like a lot of brain damage, he thought he was fine. He noticed nothing different with himself and didn't really believe us. But, you know, we just basically said, well, it's this or you have to go into a home. Those are the only two options. And so he said, okay, I'll accept them coming in. And, you know, they did a great job of giving him his space. They had a separate room that they could sit in and still sort of see him, but, you know, back off so he didn't feel like he was being watched 24-7. When they were there in that separate room kind of giving him that independence, what kind of care were they providing for him? They would try and get him to eat. He wasn't really interested in eating much. So, you know, they got really creative with it. They realized that he really likes to tell people how to do things. And so they would go, I just don't understand how to make eggs. Could you tell me more? And when he would sort of interact, then he'd be much more likely to eat and drink, which really helped. I mean, he ate more than he usually would just having them around. They also, you know, helped to bathe him and stuff because he didn't really know if it was daytime or nighttime or how many days had gone by. So there was someone there to keep up with those things on a regular basis. They also would just sit there and talk to him, talk about his life, talk about things that mattered to him and just make him not feel alone when, you know, we couldn't be there as well. And they would also keep in contact with me. So we got heads up when we, he was seeming to not do so well so that we could go, okay, well, we'll stay close and we may be doing a hospital visit or things like that. And they would take him to the hospital so I didn't have to, you know, race out there thinking he was on his own. They would escort him to appointments, to hair appointments. So we always knew that he was safe and if anything happened, that person would be able to call emergency, know how to deal with him, and keep me informed on what was going on until I could be there. That's phenomenal. And it sounds like he's got a big personality on him. He liked to show people how to do things, and that was a way to get them to eat. Yeah, big personality, positive and negative. So they also dealt with him when he just would lash out and, you know, just be like, get out of my face, and I don't like you, and stuff like that. It would just roll right off their backs and they would just give them some space and start again. I mean, I couldn't do that job. (laughs) Were there things that would come up that would be challenging that you would have to deal with or how if there was a a really hard day, how would Nurse Next Door handle that? There were several times where we had to say, you know, they would call and say, I'm really concerned. He doesn't seem to be doing well. I really think, you know, he needs to go to the hospital. So we'd say, go ahead. They'd call 911 The ambulance would be on their way, and then I would have time to sort of get dressed, get ready, you know, to head out to the hospital. While the whole time, they would be texting me and calling me, letting me know what's going on and what everybody's saying, so you don't feel quite as hurried and rushed and stressed out. And, you know, they would be there when he was being difficult, and, you know, a lot of the time, they would talk to me you know, about how this is normal with brain damage and, you know, it's fine and all those kinds of things that just really help you know that his behavior isn't out of the norm (laughs) or anything like that. So that helps to know as well. Well, I'm sure like you're also at the same time going through quite a bit knowing that this is happening with your dad. How are you navigating it? Well, we've been in this situation with my dad and his drinking a very, very long time. So we all knew there's only one way this leads. So it was just really helpful to not have to be there all the time where we could just go, I need a break from this mentally, but we know he's well taken care of. So I'm going to take a few days and just not go over and just give myself a break from it to be able to go over and know that the house was clean, he was cleaned up. You could just focus on, you know, trying to spend 
some positive time with him and, you know, bringing his grandkids to see him and not have to be going, oh, well, now I have to do this and this and this. It was all done. You could just come and enjoy the visit and try and get some positive time in there. I know your father passed away. Tell me a little bit about the day that you found out. Well, it was in the evening, so I was just about to get into bed, and my phone rang, and they just basically said, you know, the care aide went to check on your dad and uh, can't find a pulse, and he's not breathing, and he's unresponsive, and we've got the ambulance on the way. So basically, they just stayed on the phone with me, and I just said, okay, I'm going to get ready. And she said, okay, I'll call you back in a bit. And as I was driving in, because it's about an hour or so long drive to get to him from where I live, they were on the phone with me all the time, talking to me, and then relaying messages to the paramedics, then connecting me to the paramedics so I could talk to them while I was on my way and try and assess what the situation was and, you know, relay what my dad's wishes were. And so, you know, I knew exactly what was going on by the time I got there. By the time I got there, they had officially pronounced him, which I think was for the best. I walked in there and the care aide was there. She was upset, but I mean, the first thing she was concerned about was how I was doing. And she sat with me and we talked and she was just so great at just being there if I needed her or just sitting with me and talking about my dad. It was just it was great. So the care at that point kind of transferred over to you for a little period of time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there was nothing more they were going to do for him. But, you know, instead of just going, well, I guess that's it for me and leaving, she stayed there until I said, you can go home. It's late. Have the rest of your shift <laughs> off. I'm I'm good. Yeah, that's when she left. But the rest of the time she was with me. Wow. And that speaks a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. It wasn't just my dad that they were concerned about. It was our whole family. And you get to know all of his care aides really well, and they become part of your family. And how are you doing with your grief now? I think I'm doing really good. I mean, I've got two young kids, so life goes on immediately. <laughs> so, you know, that helps. <laughs> they kind of force that. Yeah, exactly. And I knew this was going to happen. So I've had years and years to prepare myself for this and know that there's nothing more for us to do. It was something we knew was coming. And I've got my mom still, and her and I are going through this together. And I think we're a great support for each other. That's so great to hear. And did you interact with Nurse Next Door much after that? Do you know how the caregivers were taking it? A lot of the care aides, they sent me texts just saying, I just heard and I'm so sad and I really loved your dad. I also got calls from like the care designer and just to see how I'm doing, if there's anything that they can do to help. So they've been in contact with me a bunch over the last couple months. Oh, wow. It's nice to know you're just not on your own, and it's nice to hear these people that cared for him really did care for him and, you know, loved talking with him and joking around, all of that. So it was just fantastic. Oh, that's so good to hear. I know there's probably quite a few people listening right now who are at the point that maybe they have to have that conversation with their parents or maybe they want to preempt that conversation with their parents. Did you ever have a conversation with your dad before his fall about what this might look like? Well, he was in pretty good denial about uh. what he was doing to his body with the drinking and the smoking. But we did talk an awful lot over the years about he didn't want to be in a hospital. And he was vocal about that even after the fall. He didn't want to be in a hospital. He didn't want to be hooked up to machines. He didn't want people trying to desperately keep him alive. He just wanted peace. So that's what I tried to give to him as much as possible, is allowing him to be peaceful at home. Yeah. And if there's someone out there who's kind of struggling navigating that conversation right now, because I know depending on the personality of your parents, it can be really, really <laughs> tough. What would you say to them? 
Well, now that he's gone and we can see parts that were missing and things that we wish we had talked about, I am 100% talking to my mom and, and anybody around me that, you know, death is something you can't get away from. It's going to happen. And if you talk about it early, you can really feel good going forward that you know what your loved one wants out of the rest of their lives. And that really helps because if you don't know, it's you know, it weighs on you. Did I make the right decision? Maybe they would have wanted something else. What are we to do? They're not conversations that people like to have, but I find the more you talk about it, the less scary and the less big it is. And, you know, you can relax knowing that you've conveyed what you want. These people are going to honor your wishes and take care of you exactly how you would have wanted. I think that's absolutely phenomenal advice for folks. Like it is a really challenging conversation and no one wants to be in that conversation, but you you have to have it before you need to have it. Yeah, exactly. Or else you're going to need to have it at some point. <laughs> yeah. And you just don't know if when you get to that point, are you going to be able to talk about it? Or are you not going to be able to because of brain injury or any number of things? I just wouldn't want to leave anybody behind that had to make hard decisions and didn't know what to do or what I wanted or feeling guilt because they think maybe they didn't do the right thing. To have it all laid out in front of you makes it so much easier because you don't have to make those decisions. They've already been made. Listening to all of this is someone who has gone through loss and grief herself recently, Kathy Thorpe. She's the president and CEO of Nurse Next Door. Her husband passed away from cancer around a year ago. So I'm really interested in what's going to happen when I bring her in to meet Julia. Hearing Julia's experience really, it pulls up my heart. You know, I've been listening to her talk to Sarah and the way she describes her father's sheer will to remain independent is something I absolutely can relate to. I lost my husband last year, and what really stood out to me was the way Julia described how her father's caregivers brought happier aging to him. Because that's what Harry, my husband, that's what he wanted at the end of his life. Everything Julia said reminded me of why we do what we do for our clients. It's about preserving their dignity and giving them a choice on how they live their lives until the very end. Morning, Julia. Good morning. I just, you know, I want to start by saying thank you for sharing. You know, I'm listening to you and I'm like, oh my goodness, I've been here for eight years in this organization and you've just spoken to so many aspects of that emotional piece of going through these types of things. It's just so amazing to hear it through your experience of it. And so many people, understand it, but it's at a different level. And I just think what you're sharing today is just unbelievable. And a couple things just really resonated with me. When you talked at the beginning about the fact that you love hearing all of the stories about how many people liked your dad and just what he meant to the community. And you can hear those things now, and that must be very special for you. Yeah, it's neat. Right. And, and then I, I wrote down too, um, when you were talking about, you know, your dad, he wasn't going to go into a facility because he knew what he wanted to do. Whatever that was at home, that was his happier aging. And if that was taken away from him, what that would have done. And maybe just talk a little bit more about that, because I think that that's a really meaningful piece that you were talking about. Well, I mean, he was stubborn. <laughs> so obviously he wanted everything how he wanted and had no patience for anything else around that. But I mean, to be able to be at home, to have your familiar stuff around also really helped with the brain damage. He knew how to function in that home and it took a lot of stress away. I don't think he would have lived nearly as long if we had had to force him into a facility. And really, I think anybody, if they ask themselves, wants to be in their home and that's where they want to stay because that's where we're the most comfortable. So, you know, this is just about honoring him and giving him some dignity as well with somebody who could take care of him properly. Oh my gosh, I love the words you use, like dignity. You articulate 
what so many families are going through and just that depth of, it's that emotion, isn't it? And yeah. we talk a lot about it's happier aging till the very end. And I feel like that's what you were able to give to your father. Yeah. When my dad was in the hospital the first time and my mom and I were sitting there going, what are we going to do? And together we both decided that the topic and the theme of this would be dignity and giving him as much dignity as we possibly could in a situation that can be messy. So everything that we did, we asked ourselves, is this giving him dignity? Are we respecting the person that he was? And as long as we had yes to answer, then we kept going. That's so beautiful. I want people to hear this story because what you're saying is just beautiful. You got to be the daughter, right? And you talk about the dignity of your dad, but it's also what you got from that experience of being able to just be the daughter. Oh, absolutely. I didn't have to see a lot of the background stuff that was going on. I did, of course, see the deterioration. But, you know, it allowed me not to be so in it that you couldn't take a step back and sort of try and go, okay, let's try and get some positive out of this and let's try and enjoy our visits with him instead of thinking, oh, God, I've got to help pick him up or, you know, I got to change him or bathe him or any of those things. I didn't have to do any of that and I didn't have to watch any of that. I could just go by and just sit with him and talk to him and not worry about any of that. And if he said he needed to get up, then, you know, I could step back and they would come in and sort of help take care of him in that way. You know, it allowed there to still sort of be a father-daughter relationship. We could visit, we could have some laughs, and I wasn't just totally consumed in taking care of him. I could just be with him. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, but I, I lost my husband to... Um, cancer a year ago and just that process of grief and what the world allows you to talk about and not talk about. And I I feel like we're here Mm -hmm. today having all these conversations. So, you know, how did that time that you were able to be the daughter and have that special time with your dad, how did that help you cope with the grief after his passing? I think there was just no regrets. I wasn't sitting there going, oh, God, you know, I wish I had been able to do this, this, or this. I wasn't feeling guilty about anything that happened with him. Knowing that he was going to pass any time sort of allowed you to sort of get that all out and spend some time. And if there was things that I wanted to say, I could say them. It was just basically three years of slowly saying goodbye. And that gives you an awful lot of closure at the end because when you get there, you're like, well, I've already said what I wanted to say. They gave me a minute with him after he passed. And I was just, I'm like, I don't have anything more to say. I've already said everything. I don't feel like there's something I need to grab onto or wish about. I feel completely satisfied with how everything went and content with it. I love that no regrets and just, you know, being able to say yeah. everything that you wanted to say. And you talked before about the fact that your dad was peaceful at home. And and what I'm hearing from you is you had that opportunity to also find peace through all of this because you had nurse next door supporting you with things that, you know, you didn't need to do. And that it gave you that space to be the daughter and go through that grieving also. Exactly. Even before he passed, because I, it is, I remember... I literally lived each day in the moment because you didn't want to see past it because you knew what that could be. So being in the moment allowed you to just have full clarity of the conversation and just be present. And I love that you were able to experience that and not have the regrets. And wow, you say things so beautifully. I just have to say thank you for that. You really do. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, my sort of theory on all of this is that we don't talk enough. People don't tell the truth. They skip over the hard parts. You know, nobody talks about what death is like and how you move through it. You know, nobody just wants to talk about that. They just want to forget that it exists. And I think, you know, if more people openly talk about it, it won't be so scary. And you kind of go, oh, well, you feel the same as me. 
I'm not all alone in these thoughts and this is normal and every single person on this planet is going to go through somebody important to them dying. So I just think the more we talk about this, the less scary it is and the better prepared everybody can be. Absolutely. And it allows you to honor that person even after they have passed away. Mm -hmm. And when you're sharing stories and when you're talking about the life that that person had, it's allowing them to still be there and still exist and still be part of our hearts. Yeah, they never go away. Right? And when we're not talking about these things, it's like that piece of your heart isn't being expressed and isn't allowed to have that opportunity to be part of our lives. Exactly. Do you have questions for me? No, I can't really think of anything. <laughs> I mean, no, well, listen, I mean, you've said it all. <laughs> you know, I'm just so thankful that Nurse Next Door exists and for all the care aids that we got to know so well. And, you know, the whole experience couldn't have been better. And it would have just been a complete disaster had we not had Nurse Next Door there to help support us. Thanks to Julia Killey, who shared her story in such a touching way. We're all grateful for that. Thanks also to Nurse Next Door's president and CEO, Kathy Thorpe. If you know someone who is thinking about how to care for their parents right now, or perhaps an older person looking for a happier way of aging, we'd love for you to send them this show. Like Julia said, it's a conversation most of us will have to have. Maybe this episode can be the starting point. How to Care is a Vocal Fry Studios production in partnership with Nurse Next Door. The producer is Jay Coburn, with production support from Jenna Ratcliffe and Miriam Ordubati. The executive producer is Katie Jensen. See you next time.